climate change is a global problem. And we need global efforts to address it. The climate doesn't care where your CO2 and greenhouse gases come from, but we need to reduce them. And we need to reduce the global pool of them, and we need to figure out who's going to be reducing, when, where, how much. And really the only authority that we have to do that is the international system where you have a system of countries, different, different states, who all have sovereignty. So you've got to agree multilaterally. You know, one of the big things that's preventing countries from doing something is basically money. You know, this isn't a sense where, um, you know, there's certainly aspects of people who say, we really don't need to do anything because of the science. Um, but that's not really the dominant discourse that you're seeing internationally. You're seeing people saying, yeah, that's great. It's going to cost a lot of money. Where are we going to get that money? Now, that's a big part of the US fight over um, some things like the Clean Power Plan, but it's also really important in countries that are trying to develop. So a lot of the agreement that where's the financing going to come from, um, the agreement is that developed countries, who again, responsible for most of the problem, are going to finance and help developing countries. Now the target that we're putting forward, 100 billion a year by 2020, and after 2020, that's in that period, 2020 to 2025, after that goes up. That's a big number, numbers in there, but the questions of how do you count, are they gonna get to that number, Have the do the pledges actually add up? That's a, that's a big outstanding question. Okay, so you got money. You've got a goal. Now, when we got to Cancun, it's thinking about from a science policy perspective, um, how to figure out how much you have to cut carbon. And where dangerous climate anthropogenic interference in the climate system is. And that's a phrase that existed in the framework convention on climate change, but wasn't defined. We want to avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference. Everyone can agree to that. But where's dangerous? And in Cancun, yeah, dangerous, let's define it at about two degrees. Two degrees relative to pre-industrial. Now, there's a, there's a goal in the text um, of the climate agreement that it mentions a 1.5 degrees as, um, as important. And this is because a lot of small island states are looking at two degrees and saying, well, at two degrees, we're going to be overrun. So 1.5 would really save us. Now, the feasibility of that is something that, that John will talk about. Uh, so this, um, <laughs> or, or not. <laughs> feasibility or not. <laughs> Countries sort of seeing air pollution problems um, are are actually paying a little bit more attention to them, even if their solutions might not be permanent solutions. Um, but I did want to raise air pollution. I didn't talk about this in, in my talk, but it's something that Valerie and I are working on together, of thinking about what would motivate people to actually um, do climate action. And one big thing can be near-term benefits of air right. pollution. Um, so thinking about what are the impacts of coal, um, a lot of mortalities and sicknesses of people who are exposed to air pollution that are a direct result of that, um, building that consensus about um, finding those win-win solutions on the ground. And this is a problem in China as well as a bunch of other countries. So I think that, you know, finding those, finding those solutions, yes, of course, if policymakers are just going to um, shut factories for one or two days, that's not a permanent solution. But there's building um, concerns um, in China and elsewhere about air pollution, and people are realizing that that's not a permanent solution and pushing policymakers to do something about it. To the extent that, that those incentives can be aligned towards climate policy, that's what we're working on and hopefully trying to move things forward. So let's go back to the Islamic State's founding in 2006. As you can tell by its name, the organization thought of itself as a state in 2006, even though it did not control any territory. Its predecessor organization, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, at least controlled a few towns sometimes. But the Islamic State, when it established itself in October 2006, it didn't control any territory, yet it put out the message that it was a state. And it even if you go back and look carefully at their propaganda, both the written word, even the flag and the design that they chose, it wanted other Muslims to think of it also as 
the caliphate. They wouldn't quite come out and say it, but they were dropping a lot of hints that that's what it was. They called their emir the commander of the faithful, which in medieval Islam is a title reserved for the caliph. They talked about their flag as the caliphate's flag. Their flag has the seal, the stamp of the prophet on it, which was carried by the caliphs as a sign of their authority. The establishment of the Islamic State went against the wishes of Al-Qaeda Central. It went against the wishes of bin Laden and Zawahiri. Their philosophy was caliphate later. Their priorities were exactly the opposite. What's most important? First, get the West out of the Middle East, particularly the Americans. Carry out strikes in the American homeland until the Americans leave and their allies leave. Next, go after local regimes and remove them. Then finally, you can establish emirates and network them together to become the caliphate. So exactly the opposite of the Islamic State. And they strongly discouraged the Islamic State from declaring itself as such and discouraged them from moving to declare themselves a caliphate until they got the Americans out of Iraq and until they had built a broad base of support among Sunni Muslims. And you're going to see this as a theme throughout the discussion tonight, that in Al-Qaeda's mind, the key to victory always is winning over broad Muslim popular support. And their differences with the Islamic State mainly had to do with this question. How much do you need popular support in order to successfully prosecute an insurgency? and then govern. So they discouraged them from declaring the Islamic State. The Islamic State's leaders uh, did it without their knowledge. And we now have the inside uh, private letters that were being exchanged at the time between Al-Qaeda Central and the Islamic State. And we can see that Al-Qaeda's leaders were totally caught by surprise. So then we come to 2011, 2012. Syria begins to descend into chaos, and the Islamic State sees an open. It's still been pushed underground in Iraq, but it's finding that it has much more freedom of action in the Sunni hinterland in eastern Syria. So here's where the formula comes into play again. While all the other rebel groups in Syria focus on overthrowing the existing government, the Islamic State focuses on establishing its own government. It thought of itself as a state. It was in the Sunni tribal heartland. It set about building that state. So the Islamic State has a two-word slogan uh, that directly bears on your point, Barry. And the two-word slogan is enduring, expanding. Both of those have to do with survival and momentum, controlling territory and pushing it out. So you can see then that the Islamic State's legitimacy is very much tied to the control of territory and its constant expansion and you take that away from them, you remove the success, you strike at the heart of their legitimacy. But it's easier said than done. I would note back in 2009, when the Islamic State never controlled any territory, and they had been pushed back underground as an insurgency, other Al-Qaeda affiliates took up its flag and its project. So it mitigated the damage uh, to its credibility because others took up its flag uh, metaphorically and literally. The Islamic State is pursuing a similar mitigation strategy and that's why you have this phenomenon of the franchising happening uh, where you have other uh, jihadist groups, uh, some of them major, some of them no names, uh, who are also taking up the Islamic State flag. Um, this does not, so far as we know, have to do with um, raising new human or 
uh, financial resources because those groups are not contributing much to ISIS, Syria and Iraq. But it's a way to keep scoring new propaganda victories and to mitigate any potential territorial loss in their future. First, I'll open just with the, with the idea that I've been talking about Turkey and working on Turkish foreign policy now for about a decade, around 10 years. Um, and when I first started talking about Turkey, the, uh, the mem that went along with Turkish foreign policy was the idea of no problems with neighbors. Then post-Arab Spring, um, I kind of switched that around and it was we had neighbors with problems. Um, and now I would say that Turkey has problems with everybody. So it's really come full circle. Um, and I think it is clear at this point that Turkey really has become part of the problem. A little bit of this is inescapable. Um, Turkey is not responsible, obviously, for the disaster in Syria, but it's hard to stay out of the conflict, both given its position on the border um, and the fact that it's hosting some 2 million Syrian refugees, only about 200,000 of which are living in camps, and many of which actually come and go across the border rather freely. Um, that said, Turkey's Syria policy combined, I think, with Erdogan's political maneuvering, and those two things I see as inseparable from one another, um, has probably done more to isolate the country at this point in time than anything else. Turkey's managed to damage relations um, with almost every country or group that really matters to its own domestic security. That includes Iran, Russia, the US, the EU, and the Kurdish communities. And now it's sinking solace in what I think is probably a relatively dead-end partnership with Saudi Arabia, although I think my esteemed colleague will have more to say um, on that point. Um, and I think that partnership is probably bound to make things a little bit worse. When the AKP came to power, so the regime that's currently ruling Turkey came to power, they came to power on a platform of rapprochement with the PKK and its leader, Abdul Ocalan. Um, but that process has disintegrated completely, and it disintegrated really, I think, over the summer of 2015. Um, Turkey's now fighting a low-scale war in the various parts of its own southeast, including provinces and territories in Shirnak and Diyarbakir. These are replete with curfews, press blackouts, and civilian casualties. It's really a pretty dire situation that we don't have a whole lot of information about. Um, and this has been accompanied by widespread consensus in certain press circles that democracy has broken down completely in Turkey and that Turkey's made a slide towards competitive authoritarianism. Um, some people even doubt the competitiveness of Turkey's authoritarianism and, and some of the electoral outcomes as of recently. Added to the mix, as I mentioned before, are these two million Syrian refugees. Um, and Turkey has been using this captive population, I think, uh, in a twofold way. One is a bargaining chip uh, in its negotiations with the European Union, so to get concessions out of the European Union. Um, and also as a buffer against international critiques of its own domestic crackdowns against its own domestic population. Um, so I think the U.S. is really devoid of good options in the Syria crisis, as it has been for a long time. Um, and I think the unfortunate fact is that the relationship with Turkey as a NATO member makes a, a set of already really bad options just even that much more complicated. Um, so the first option might be to move forward with a ceasefire, but the Sur Turks don't want the Syrian Kurds at the table, but the Syrian Kurds at this point control way too much territory for them to legitimately be left out um, of any negotiations. So that's a real sticking point there um, if we go with a ceasefire or an accord. Um, the second option may be to just continue to allow the Russians to keep bombing the opposition into oblivion um, and wait and see what happens, which seems to be in some ways the de facto strategy, not one that I necessarily agree with. But this strategy runs the risk of losing the Syrian Kurds to Russia. The Russians have been known to be courting the Syrian Kurds, um, and the U.S. could lose uh, this alliance, potentially. This could also escalate, I think, Russian-Turkish tensions, not to mention the fact that it's going to bolster the Assad regime, and it's not clear that that's what anybody wants. And then finally, I think there's the option that Western powers could take a more direct action um, against the Syrian military. Although, in my opinion, the day for this, if there ever was one, um, and I've, I've been a proponent of, of not getting more directly involved in this conflict because I think we don't have a very good track record um, in meddling in these kind of conflicts. But if there was a day for this, I think it's long since passed. Um, we don't have a good track record with these things, as I mentioned. And the Assad regime has proven really resilient, and it has committed backers. Also, I think it's unclear how Turkey's escalation and reckless driving with a YPG would play out if the U.S. also ramped up its involvement in a more direct way. 
Um, conceivably, this could put Turkey and the U.S. in conflict as the Turks work more closely with conservative Sunni opposition groups, maybe in and around Aleppo, and the U.S. perhaps comes to rely more closely on the YPG. Uh, there, uh, there seems to be uh, an attraction to bad news, uh, and so uh, whenever things get quiet, uh, it seems that uh, certain folks in the media uh, exploit whatever's wrong with whatever's going on of the day, and, and we tend to get into the negative. Uh, many of the things that they highlight, of course, have a flip side, and, and there are aspects of activities in Afghanistan that are going going well and uh, that have been vastly improved certainly since Taliban days. Uh, but there's certainly been an uptick in violence and uh, in casualties both to uh, coalition forces and <clears throat> to the population. I think there are a lot of dynamics here. Um, you have to have some stability and security to effectively have these other instruments bear fruit. The ground has to be fertile. And so um, my experience, I'd like to use the minimum amount of force to provide some basic security for people so that these other things can happen. But you can't, it's wishful thinking to just say we're going to flood the place with people who are well-intentioned. The people have to be trained and they have to be able to get results. And most Peace Corps people that I've run into are terrific but they're working in very benign environments in which they're able to use their talents. And many of these talents are educational, teaching people things. But there's some, some very significant basic needs in this country that are not going to be met just with Peace Corps people. So you know, we're trying to come up with a, the appropriate blend and mix of capabilities that will, that will get the results. Um, but I, I wanted to follow up on this because you, you I you spent a lot of time on this. Yeah, yeah, and I appreciate kind of the the fact that indeed there are stereotypes that the US presence is confronted with. And I, I want to bring up an anecdote from a couple of kind of patrols in the South. Um, you know, some young soldier basically went and met with his group of people, you know, helmet off, black jacket off, just really trying to be you know, as close to them as possible. Basically went and said just, you know, like, I, I wanna, we want to help you here. Just tell us what you want. We can build you a well. We can make an irrigation canal, a microhydro generator. What is it? And the Malik, kind of the local leader, basically said, no, 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 we don't want any of that. Just stop bombing us. So just to give you an example of someone who's like it's some brilliant young soldier who really is trying to kind of sell this new notion of see what, what I want to do for you. And the existing stereotype, no, 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 you're one of those that just bomb us. Similarly, in a kind of in a different context, they went to a different village. They said, you know, we know there's Taliban in your village, but we need to figure out a way to work with this. After all, we can't kill them all. And the Malik said, you can't? Why? Just shoot them. <laughs> so just a different approach of, again, like some of these people not necessarily wanting what we have to offer or not believing that this is what we are about. So. I think this is a really a terrific. Uh, um, as we get into this discussion, you bring up aspects of this that are very pertinent. And uh, it's, a, it's a real dilemma when dealing with people at, at the local level. Um, if they have Taliban or insurgents that are in their midst and they have a presence that's been supported one, or facilitated one way or another, they're going to be very nervous and very uh, anxious to just get away you know, get to, to, because the presence of uh, these foreign forces uh, is likely to end up in a conflict and so you know, other bad news will spread. On the other hand, they don't really want these people in, the, in their midst. Uh, most of them would love to be, to be free of them. Um, I think you'd like to, uh, from the coalition forces, security forces would like to be very selective in the use of force to try to remove the, the most threatening element of it and not disturb the rest. Uh, but sometimes that becomes uh, problematic. And, uh, and again, uh, it really requires very thoughtful, localized applications. Um, uh, getting our people close to the people, the local people, the natives, um, 
to get accepted and recognize that we're really not here to kill everybody. We don't want to do that. We would prefer to figure out a way to remove this, this uh, thorny element from your side and, and end up with a better life. But it's, it's very difficult. And, uh, and it's, it, there is no simple answer. You don't just walk away or just come in and, and stomp on people. You've got to find, figure out the way, uh, some way to, to try to be effective to get results. But again, at the end of the day, uh, we can do a lot of things as outsiders, but the local people, leaders, are going to sooner or later have to rise up and take charge of their own futures or uh, it's not going to be successful. Yemen is one of the poorest countries in the Middle East, probably one of the poorest countries in the world. What are some of the statistics on this country? About the size of France, population maybe 25 million. The most important fact on this population is that 50% of the population is under the age of 15. Now, often when we talk about developing countries, we'll talk about 50% of it's under 25 or something. This is 50% of the countries under 15. This is a sonic baby boom waiting to happen. This is a country, all of that country, there is not a single river, a single lake, any freestanding fresh water. Its oil production, it sits on the Arabian Peninsula, one of the major sources of oil and natural gas in the entire world. Yemen's oil production is equivalent to that of Bakersfield, California. Bakersfield, California doesn't produce a lot of oil. The fundamental challenges that Yemen faces are, uh, are critical natural resource issues, energy and water, and an insufficient state in human capacity. Yemen's government is not unmindful of the threat that is posed by al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, but that is not its sole threat and is not yet an existential threat. Yemen, oddly enough, or believe it or not, is politically more developed than the three template states of Iraq, Afghanistan, and Somalia. The US Congress, current and past administrations, and major democracy support organizations all have recognized Yemen as an emerging democracy. More importantly, it is an indigenous democracy. Uh, and it is one based on Yemeni traditions of participation, accountability, um, and an egalitarian structure. It has its flaws, it has its problems, but it is a democracy. This country has a very large and active uh, civil society. It has a very large number of its own NGOs. Let's work on developing their capacity as well. Is it slower? Is it less efficient? I'm not really sure in the long run it is, but um, it seems so when you're doing it. Is there some leakage of funds? Probably. But given the corruption that we've had with some of our own NGOs and contractors, I'm not, I don't feel terribly, terribly um, um, holy in that regard. Um, but on the assumption, based on my own history of Yemen, our attention span for this country is very limited. And so if we try to go in and do these things ourselves, first of all, we don't do it very well. Second, when we do leave, and we will leave, they're no better off than when we went in. So let's build up their capacity. Let me give you an example about how this can work. When I was there, um, came to the realization that landmines, are a major problem in Yemen. Uh, we think of Cambodia and Laos and, and Angola and a few other places as mine infested countries. And actually Yemen was one of the worst mine impacted countries in the world. So came up with this great idea that we were gonna do a landmine eradication program. Major victims of landmines are usually girls under the age of 10. When I finally got this thing organized, uh, working with the Yemenis, find out if they wanted to do it, always first thing, ask them if it's something they actually want you to do. Um, I was besieged by American contractors who were going to come in and take out all the landmines, and that was going to be it. And you've got to do this, got to do this. And I kept saying, no, I am not going to do this. I'm, we're going to train Yemenis to do this. We have an unemployment problem. Why should I import Americans when I've got unemployed Yemenis? Uh, it's a Yemeni problem. Besides that, they're probably going to have a better idea where the landmines are. So why don't we work through them? And 
through uh, a lot of arguments, finally was able to establish a Yemeni demining program. And I was explicit uh, about it's not the American demining program. It's the Yemeni demining program. As we worked through this, and we got into train the trainer, and we developed their capacity, and we developed their structures, and we provided, assisted them with developing uh, the transportation and the mapping and all these other things, an education program, a public awareness program, on and on and on. When I left, there were 900 Yemeni D miners. We had only been doing the training for the trainers. Four years later, Aden, which was a heavily mine impacted city, was declared landmine free. Can this approach sometimes help us in ways we don't anticipate? Yes, very much so. Uh, going back to my D miners, one of the things that we provided them was you have to be able to get to the minefield. So we provided them with a whole range of vehicles. We were a little concerned about them using these vehicles for. Um, purposes that didn't directly de relate to the, de the demining program. So we painted them absolute cherry red and figured at least we'd be able to see where they were as they were being used. Um, because we were working with landmines, we also established a mass casualty arrangement with an Aden hospital and did a couple of drills with this hospital on mass casualties. Again, assuming it was going to be something like you know, you take all the landmines, you put them in a pile, you blow them up, and you can sometimes cause damage. Well, on October 12, 2000, we did have a mass casualty event. Uh, the USS Cole was, was blown up in Aden Harbor. <clears throat> when that happened, uh, you could hear the explosion all over uh, Aden Harbor. Um, the Yemeni deminers figured out what it was long before the Americans did jumped into all of those cherry red vehicles that we had provided them, went down to the port, helped uh, evacuate our wounded off of the ship, and took them to that hospital where we had been doing mass casualty uh, exercises. And we did not lose a single wounded sailor. Now maybe we wouldn't have lost them anyway, who knows. But the Yemenis were the ones who were the first responders. And we all know how critical that is. And they did that because, first, we had given them the tools. But second, we had the relationship with them. So these kinds of programs can have a benefit that you don't expect. What is going to be, ha what happened exactly in Egypt? It's simply, it's a revolution. And uh, when I think that what we did in the last three years, I think that only we are a crazy person. How we think that we can change our country and Mubarak was sitting his seat, in his seat for 30 years. And we was working underground and above ground. And before that three years that we was working, we was a member of Kifaya movement. Kifaya movement, it, it's, the meaning of Kifaya by English is enough. That we are saying clear to Mubarak is enough. Ali was the, one of our members also. We met here to him today by luck. I'm so happy to meet him. And... Uh, Exactly the 6th of April was starting 6th of April 2008. Why 6th of April? The date because of the, the, the uh, it was the first day co called for general strike in Egypt. We start our idea through Facebook, uh, Facebook page, normal as an event page. In December 2007, we got invitation from Al Mahalla Al Kubra, from workers working in one city in Egypt called Al Mahalla Al Kubra. It's around two hours of Cairo. They are asking us, please come to support us. There is one uh, protest and strike in 6th of April, exactly. And Ahmed was, his, he, his, he was the, the creator or the founder of that page, exactly, in the Facebook. I don't know what happened in a few days, a few hours. We got a lot of members, around 76 members come up to the page. And like that, they are looking for the word of strike. What does mean strike? It was the first time, really, it was the first time people knows what does mean strike, that we are looking to change our country through strike or civil disobedience. Really, it was a surprise. And Ahmed was asking people in the page, why only strike must be in, might be in Mahal al Kubra only? Let's go for general strike in Egypt. There is big surprise, hab surprise happened in 6th of April and 7th of April that our idea is succeed, that it, the, the, the day I forget to mention that we are asking people in 6th of April, April to be in home, just to stay in home. Don't go to your work, just don't go to schools and universities and like that. 
We are thinking that can we change our country through civil disobedience? The idea was to start about to be as a movement. Ahmed come back, uh, came back uh, to the Facebook and he asked the guys, event is done, yeah. But why we, sh we, why we should shut down the, the page? We can go together for one meeting in one place to start the first movement, youth movement, not only in Egypt, but in all Arab countries. And really it's happened. It was the 6th of April. Our target was since day one, what we want to do. Our target is simply clear. We are going to change the regime. Yeah, we are crazy. Fine, no problem. We would like to change the regime. No problem. We know that they might kill us. They might, and it's happened really many times. They are arrested us. After we create that movement, police come, the security, uh, security state in Egypt came to uh, arrest Ahmed. For two days, they are hitting him in police station, and they, are ask, they asked him two questions. Who is the member of, the, of, the, of that page? I can't, Ahmed telling them that I can't tell you who is the member. They are 76,000 members. How can, how can I tell you? I can't tell you who is the member. And second thing, what's the password of the page? Two days they are hitting him because of the password. I think even if Ahmed knows the password because they are hitting him, he might forget the password actually. <laughs> the target was we are looking to change the country. And if you are looking to change the country, I consider that change as a product. And we looking to sell our product to the customers and our customers with our people, Egyptian people. When we are looking to change our country, like I said, we consider that change as a product. And if you are selling any product to any customers, you must study the mentality of your customers, how they are thinking. This is the marketing meaning. We find that 40% of Egyptians, they, they are living under poverty line. Them income day by day less than $2. So those kind of people, if I'm going to ask him, please come to share me in protest or revolution, what's the answer? Of course, he will shoot me by the shoes, direct. Only he's looking for his eat day by day, where he will sleep, how he will drink. And 30% of Egyptians doesn't know even how to write and read their names. So new use if I'm giving him brochure or something like that to, to join me in other movement, news for that. But I must create some ways to reach him. I want them to reach, to, to join me. The question was since day one, once people will join us as activists, and come down in the streets for protests. And after that, we will ask them that we are already right now in the streets and we are very strong and we are a huge number. We can start the word called civil disobedience and we can be in Tahrir Square for some days. This is the meaning of revolution. We face a bad dilemma now in terms of humanitarian action and human rights. The wars of our time are overtaking our capacities to protect ordinary people from harm. War itself is mutating in ways not well foreseen by formal military doctrine or long articulated laws of war. And the architecture of human rights and humanitarian response, built on a more recent platform established at the end of World War II, is visibly crumbling under the strain of what war is now unleashed upon the world. There are many trends that have brought us to this place, including severe disparities in income, wealth, education, and life opportunities, ecological degradation, feckless or rapacious government, shattered expectations spun by globalization, and an explosion in the availability of small arms linked to malignant doctrines espoused by skilled peddlers of hate. One could pull a string from this midst and argue well that any of these factors is pivotal. At the heart of the matter from my perspective is our collective failure to deal productively with the tensions arising from diversity within a nation state. From Mogadishu to Kosovo, from Angola to Israel-Palestine, from Tbilisi to Bangladesh, my observations and analyses lead me to two main observations. Perceiving difference People will not live together unless they are encouraged and constrained to do so. And structures of government and civil society must never take their eye off this imperative. This somewhat idiosatic, idiosyncratic historical account 
places the quest for homogeneity of peoples at the causal center of current wars, especially those laced with instances of mass atrocity, and the current eruption of forced migration. <clears throat> Historical experience suggests that mass atrocity arises in two main contexts, organized mass violence or war, and intensifying hate campaigns against identified populations within a country. From the mid-19th century to the present, the international community has endeavored to limit this tendency to kill and destroy the other through elaboration of laws and institutions. In the spring of 2015, the international community faces the largest number of refugees and IDPs since the end of World War II. And it shows every sign, the trend line has now reached close to 50 million, and it shows every sign of exceeding that figure in the months ahead. The reasons lie in the changing nature of war and in the broken framework of refugee resettlement. And this graphic does not extend beyond 2011, and it's in part because the refugee communities of record are not accounting for these refugees and displacements according to the same rubric. So it's harder to build the graph. But it is now well up to the 50 million. So the changing nature of war and in the broken framework of refugee resettlement, we see these numbers rise. A discernible and often dominant pattern in these wars of the last 35 years is a vicious animus against an identifiable subpopulation within the particular nation state. Not only do the non-state or rogue state armed actors directly target civilians, but they also preferentially target civilians who belong to population groups who are in various combinations hated, stigmatized, despised, or feared. We are living in an era when mass atrocity crimes, including war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity, as well as genocide, are or have been widely practiced with a disconcerting level of impunity or even comment. As in former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, DRC, Sudan, Egypt, Kenya, Central Africa, Zimbabwe, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Israel-Palestine, and now Burma. <clears throat> there is um, no way to explain these attacks on these populations except as attacks against distinct peoples, distinguishable on the basis of race, ethnicity, religion, language, tribe, or social and political affiliation. Perhaps what is needed now is for countries in Europe and the US to open our doors and embark on a large-scale UN-organized program of temporary settlement. Those Syrian refugees who seek to leave Lebanon and Turkey and Jordan and Iraq must be given the supports to do so and find temporary refuge in countries of relative wealth and stability in the 1990s, we opened these doors for refugees from Somalia, the Sudan, and the Balkans. But governments now freeze in the face of such large numbers of people considered very different from their own citizenry. We again confront the implicit and atavistic contours of the nation state as a bulwark of homogeneity. Hope lies in the extremity of the problem and the growing consternation of national and UN leaders. In the meantime, we teach human rights and international humanitarian law and humanitarian response and child protection and the liberal arts in all its fine cacophony of voices because we must continue to believe that the next generation will prove more humane and resourceful than ours has turned out to be. We've got a pretty interesting uh, subject, and, uh, and the, the really interesting thing is that you've got a very, very distinguished panel here of people with uh, uh, tremendous uh, credentials in their professional fields, all of which are very broad and intersect in many aspects of our uh, lives and society. Uh, first of all, uh, we are in a decidedly different world in the business of intelligence and national security than we were just a few years ago when I was on active duty, in that the, uh, the leapfrogging advances in technology uh, enable um, so many more things to occur. Another aspect is the detail of the revelations uh, that have come out. Uh, some uh, 
Uh, I'm sure you've seen are uh, decried by our government leaders, uh, many of them as exceedingly uh, damaging and dangerous. And uh, we probably uh, have a few thoughts on, uh, on this as well. I'm going to not get off on the question of whether um, this guy is a saint or a villain. Uh, I want to talk about, because he's, 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 we all want to think that people who do things we particularly don't like or do like are all one or the other. And this is a very, very complex set of problems that this man has loosed upon us. I want to point out at the beginning that we are in the midst of an ext an, a very unusual, I think unique, intelligence affair. Previous intelligence scandals have involved a failure to warn, such as the failure to warn uh, of, Pearl, of the Pearl Harbor attack, or systematic abuses of legal authorities to spy on Americans, such as came out during the Church Pike hearings in 1976. We now have an intelligence agency that's being criticized for collecting too much foreign intelligence and for having collected metadata on American citizens, which whatever you think of the merits of the program were authorized by a Congress that did know what it was authorizing and that were subsequently approved by a series of federal judges. This is the first time we've had an intelligence scandal involving an agency that's done what it was legally authorized to do. Now, when I arrived at NSA as the Inspector General in 2002, I, was, I learned very quickly about the, what came to be known as the President's Surveillance Program or the Terrorist Surveillance Program that the New York Times broke and, and to the public uh, in December of 2005. It's as foolish in politics to subordinate tactical advantage to strategic issues as it is in military operations, and that's what you're doing. It wasn't my job to make that decision. And you know what eventually happened. After the business came out in the New York Times, the attendant publicity was vastly greater than would have attended a discussion of this in the Congress in 2002. The Obama administration now finds itself, it is perplexed to find itself in fundamentally the same position, notwithstanding the fact that what NSA did in terms of the metadata, which is mostly what the public has focused on, only on the metadata, because the public had no notion of the, pervasive no uh, of the pervasive collection of this data, and partly because of the way the information was broken, still has very little understanding of the fact that the rules by which NSA can consult this data are very strict and strictly enforced. And we have found ourselves now in a scandal that, would have, that has produced a public hostility and public both understanding and misunderstanding far greater than would have happened if we had released this information, as I believe we should have done. The government should have had this, had this in 2008. Uh, some of you might remember that the center organized a public forum immediately after 9-11 and that we held another one immediately after 311, which was the catastrophe in Japan that claimed 20,000 lives in a matter of minutes. Uh, our, our purpose then, in those meetings as our purpose now, um, is to share what we know and to provide, if we can, a fuller context uh, for, uh, for the community on a crisis that affects us all. But this time, it, it really is different. This is, a, this is a different event, a different kind of crisis. It was more personal uh, for us here in Cambridge uh, than any of us, I think, dared imagine. Uh, we meet today in the very near shadow of a great personal loss, 
and unaccustomed terror uh, at the marathon finishing line across the river, at the hospitals nearby, at the Stata Center, which is just steps away from, from this spot on this, on this campus, and in the streets and in the shops uh, by our homes. We've all been touched very directly and very deeply, first by terrorism and then by heroism. What if the purpose of the, that they're thinking, again, rational, crazy, whatever, hateful, jihadist, whatever you, however we classify it, what, what if the purpose was to show us our own reaction to this kind of attack? And, and in a sense to show us the ineffectiveness of our own counter-terrorist uh, killings and signature strikes over there in the Islamic world? Great question. So I'll say real quick, I mean, I don't know if you've seen, there are a couple um, polls about how Americans feel about drones. And it's very interesting, you know, the majority of Americans are supportive of using drone strikes abroad, but then the question comes to what about drones on the uh, U.S.-Mexican border or domestic drones, and then the number goes way down. So there definitely is kind of a disconnect there, but apparently in terms of the technology and whether it's kind of for thee but not for me or these types of questions that I think uh, were the bombers thinking in that regard, there's a lot of, you know, kind of potential traction there they could be trying to expose or getting us to think about. Um, but just as I, I'm at, you know, even though I talked a lot about this stuff in kind of the context of political violence, and I'm still a little bit hesitant to say that this attack was necessarily political, I still don't think we 100% know that for sure. Um, I definitely don't think, and I feel like there's enough evidence yet to say they were doing it for the motivations that you were saying. So while I do think, you know, from the classes that I teach, I've had a number of students who have raised questions along these lines and saying, well, you know, this is a tragedy. Some of them were running the marathon and were within a minute or two of where the bombings happened. But we talk a lot about intervention in Syria or places where, you know, 70 or 80,000 people have been killed. And so how do you compare those or why do I care so much more about this one down the block than, you know, that one over there? And I think those are worthwhile questions to ask. I do think that there definitely is a disconnect. Some people here pointed to the fact that in America, thankfully to some degree, but nonetheless, we do live in a bit of a naive bubble about some political violence, don't face it the same way other societies necessarily do. So I think that whether that was the intention or not of the bombers, and I, I don't think there's enough evidence to yet say it was, I do think I have seen some of this reconsideration or thinking and connecting this to that broader context. And I'm not sure what the result of that conversation will be, but I do see this evidence of this. The question I think you're asking is, are we looking at this in a political framework or are we looking at it in terms of psychology? So I, I, think, I think it's very tough because I think the the examples that we have before, uh, in previous years, we have um, Dr. Hassan at, at Fort Hood, you know, uh, killing 13 people. You have, also with a jihadist uh, background, if you will, or taking that framework. But you also have Timothy McVeigh, and people forget Timothy McVeigh was using fundamentalist Christian language in the months before he went out, you know, went and blew up the building. So. Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's really difficult. It, it, there can be political metaphors, but when you have just two people or one person, are, are you really looking at a, some great political message, or are you looking at someone looking, uh, seeking the exhilaration of violence, the exhilaration of violence, of doing something mortally terrible and enjoying it, see, and wanting it? And I think that, that looks like more of a driver uh, in this particular case than, uh, than even 9-11, by the way. It's interesting, we have some disagreement about what motivated the, the uh, attackers. I saw this from the very beginning as a standard Al-Qaeda attack. I even, it even fits the sort of cookie cutter that you'll find you know, people describing the, the AQ method around the world. Strike a symbolic target, you know, uh, Boston Marathon, you know, symbolic of American freedom, yada. Do it with careful thought given to the, um, uh, to camera angles, because it's all about uh, PR. You know, they, they put the bombs in, in the place where the cameras would catch it most likely. Uh, the two, the, the, Al Qaeda likes to do two things. They like the, you know, first you hit this, then you hit that. They never attack, you know, with a single blow. Again, we saw the two bombs. It looked to me like they'd been kind of looking up stuff on the net as to how the standard AQ attack is carried out. And I think that the process by which they became radicalized followed closely the way we've seen others radicalized by their contact with Anwar al laki who was the um, radical preacher in Yemen, who uh, seems to have influenced Hassan, the uh, guy who attacked um, Fort Hood, and he seems to have influenced uh, the guy who attacked Times Square, tried to attack. So to me, this was uh, 
look to me like rather cookie cutter standard Al Qaeda attack. And if so, um, religion has a lot to do with what happened here. This was this what, and I, I like the the question Adi asked. It's a great question. How to talk about this in the context of religion, and how to bring up the fact that there's a religious dimension here. And if we don't deal with it, we're not dealing with the reality. Um, now, I guess I'd say two things. One is every religion has their crazies. Every religion has their crazies, and I think we need to have sort of a different discourse in the world in which. Um, the crazies of every faith are called to account and are held accountable because they have to be. Now, how can we do that in a way that doesn't stigmatize or lead to um, blaming or scapegoating the larger faith of which they're part? These jihadis are a teeny weeny piece of the Muslim world. They're a, a minority within a minority. They're, they're, they're an extremely small segment of the, of the whole. Um, so it's ex very both inaccurate and immensely unfair to stigmatize the wider Muslim community for their actions. My view is that extreme events and extreme behaviors almost always have multiple causes, and all, usually multiple interacting causes. So I don't mean to uh, suggest when I point to the jihadi narrative that it was the sole cause. I think it was, that was a key factor. Without it, there would have been no attack. But factors that Sylvia's pointing to as well, the uh, trauma that these uh, folks suffered both as, you know, your concept of refugee deficit, you know, I'd never thought of it before, but that's fascinating or the you know, adolescents coming and you know, not integrating and being alienated, or um, Jean's whole point about psychology and uh, perhaps we're dealing to some degree with psychopathy or sociopath conduct, uh, folks who enjoy violence. You understand Hitler's violence? Well, you have to understand he was an anti-Semite. He also enjoyed killing people. Uh, these two things have to fit together to understand the Holocaust, in my opinion. So I think we had a number of causes here and they were each necessary but insufficient to bring about what happened.